Welcome to the quick start video for the University of Toronto Undergraduate Advanced Physics Lab Sonoluminescence Experiment. In the past, students have had trouble seeing sonoluminescence, so the goal of this guide is to help you see your first light in the first lab period, so in subsequent lab periods you can investigate this fascinating phenomena. The first thing you want to do is to turn on the oxygen meter. It needs about five minutes to warm up before making a measurement, and we're going to need it in a few minutes. Now we want to get some distilled water and start cooling and degassing it. Distilled water is available from the lab technologists in room 250. Now, before putting any water into the ornamental flask, inspect it for damage, dirt, dust, lint, and uh, you know, rinse out if necessary. Pumping on a damaged flask could cause it to implode, and contaminated water may not sonoluminesce. For example, a piece of lint can be trapped at an antinote, preventing bubbles from being trapped. Once the flask is clean, fill it with about 500 milliliters of distilled water. In later lab periods, you may want to add more water if you're going to do multiple fills, but more water takes longer to cool and degas, so 500 milliliters is enough to start. Now we want to cool the water, so first we need to get some ice from our ice machine. Pack the ice around the flask. Now, dry crushed ice is not the fastest way to cool the flask, because it doesn't conduct heat very well because of all the air gaps. Adding water greatly improves the cooling rate. In addition to cooling the water, we also need to remove most of its dissolved gases. If we just leave the water undisturbed, the gas has to diffuse through the water to reach the surface and escape. The diffusion constant of gases in water is about 10 to the minus 5 centimeters squared per second, so it would take about 100,000 seconds, in other words a day, for the gas to diffuse out of a few centimeter thickness of water. You don't want to wait that long. To speed things up, we are going to stir the water while we pump on it. Place the bin with the flask on the stirrer. If the stirrer is also hot plate, as this one is, make sure the heater is turned off. We want cold, not hot water, and melting the plastic bin would make an unpleasant mess. Turn the stirrer on such that the stirring rod rotates smoothly. Too high a setting and the rod will jump around, which we don't want. You may have to adjust the position of the flask so it is centered on the stirrer. We want to cool the water to almost freezing temperature and remove most of the gases, so it is nice to know what the starting values are in case we need cooling or degassing rates later. The temperature can be measured with a simple glass thermometer, but here we use a thermocouple attached to the oxygen meter. Note that an infrared thermometer doesn't work in this case. We want to remove all the different dissolved gases, which are mostly nitrogen and oxygen from the air. Oxygen is the easiest one to measure, so we use its concentration as a proxy for all of them. We are now ready to start removing gases from the water. Insert the stopper with attached hose into the flask opening, making sure the round black valve is open and the T valve is closed. If the black valve is closed, the vacuum pump will only evacuate the hose and not the flask, and you'll wonder why the water is not degassing. If the T valve is open, the pump will just suck in air from the room and not pump on the water. You'll wonder why the water is not degassing and may eventually damage the vacuum pump. Turn on the pump and the gauge will immediately show the pressure dropping in the flask. Note the time. The water should be ready in about half an hour. While the water is being cooled and degassed, start setting up the detectors. Here we have the electronics for the experiment. Tektronix TDS 2010 oscilloscope, a Hewlett Packard 33120A function generator, and a Teach bin Sonal Luminescence SL100B Sonal Luminescence uh, box, and a few other items which we'll get to later. So right now we turn everything on, the uh, oscilloscope, the function generator, and the Sonal Luminescence box, which is at the back there. So the oscilloscope complains about factory calibration, but that is not important for what we're doing here. So we'll just skip over that. So now everything's on, and let's look at the equipment here. Here's the cell where we're going to put the water in and where the solid analysis is going to occur. We also need something to make bubbles, and what we have here is a little heater where we're going to put some current through there that will heat the water and make tiny little bubbles. And we put it in on the side here, hold it with a bulldog clip. As long as it's somewhere off to the side, it should work. In order to see the light quantitatively, we also have a photomultiplier tube here in the back, which has a little shield on it to protect it from light when it's not in use. Photomultiplier tubes don't like being exposed to light generally, even when they're off, it's not good for them. So we, it's not terrible, but not good. So anyway, so we take the shield off and bring this photomultiplier tube, it's a side photomultiplier tube, up close to the tank. We haven't filled it with water yet. The other thing you can see here is an LED flasher, which we can make flash using this LED trigger button here. Let's see, make sure it works. I hope you can see that. It's a very faint red glow when I press the button. We're going to use that to make sure the photomultiplier tube is working. 
So our heater's connected, all the other wires have been connected already. If not, you will have to connect them up, figure out what's going on. Inspect the subtle luminescent cell for dirt, dust, lint, contamination, or any other residue. To clean and test the cell, get about 400 milliliters of regular tap water and fill the cell up to about 11 centimeter use, using the long net funnel. We are pumping down the water to remove dissolved gases, so we don't want to add gas back in by pouring the water in all higgledy piggledy. This isn't important now, but it will be when we pour in the gassed water later, so it is good to practice the pouring now. You want to fill the cell in one continuous pour. If you break the pour, you will force bubbles through the funnel into the water. Make sure the ultrasound horn is about a centimeter deep into the water. Make sure the photomultiplier tube is covered and the photomultiplier tube power is turned off into the SL100B box. Note that the LED has been moved so that it is somewhat visible by the photomultiplier tube. Set the function generator to about 1 volt peak-to-peak -peak amplitude and 27 kilohertz frequency. Play with the buttons, you'll figure out how. On the SL100B box, turn up the horn drive to about 5 and press auto set on the oscilloscope. You should see a 27 kilohertz sinusoidal signal on channel 1. Adjust the frequency until the maximum amplitude is observed. Because this is regular gassy tap water, the sinusoidal signal may be noisy as bubbles anywhere in the cell oscillate, but this is sufficient to familiarize yourself with the equipment. Use the support stand knobs to adjust the depth of the ultrasound horn tip until the maximum amplitude is observed. Note that the knob on the left releases the horn and the one on the right moves it up and down, but sometimes moving the one to the right also releases the horn, so be careful that the horn doesn't come crashing down under its own weight. You may need to retighten the left knob as you adjust the right. Remove the cover from the PMT and adjust the position of the PMT in the LED so that the PMT can see light from the LED in any sonoluminescent bubble trapped in an antinode in the future. Close the door on the wooden box containing the sonoluminescence equipment. Make sure it's light tight. Turn the PMT voltage to about 8 or 9. You should see random single pulses from the PMT on channel 2. You'll need the trigger on channel 2 and may need to adjust other oscilloscope settings. The PMT pulses are small and very narrow. Pressing the LED button should increase the rate of pulses seen on the oscilloscope. Try it a few times. Turn off the PMT power. This is important. If you forget, you may fry the PMT. Slowly unfasten and open the door. Keep an eye on the oscilloscope since channel 2 will go crazy if you've forgotten to turn off the PMT power. Suction the water out of the cell using our handy mini wet-dry vacuum cleaner. Take the vacuum cleaner to a large sink to empty it out if it feels full. Okay, let's see how our water's doing. Now it's still stirring, it's cooling, it's pumping. So in order to test what state it's in, we need to turn off the pump first. Then we need to open this little valve here to let some air in. Otherwise we won't be able to pull the plug out or it might, something unpleasant might happen. So we open it a little bit. And then we can close it right now so we don't forget to, to open later. So we wiggle this a bit. And off it comes, hanging this here. Now we can dangle, oops, have to take the cap off. So we can dangle our thermocouple and oxygen meter into the water again and see where we are. Okay, so we see that the, uh, the uh, temperature is now 3.6 Celsius and the oxygen level still, you have to wait for it to settle with the oxygen meter it can take a while, so it's 2.6, 2.5, 2.4, 2.5, 2.6, 2.5, 2.6, 2.5, 2.6, 2.5, 2.6, 2.5, 2.6, 2.5, 2.6, 2.5, 2.6, 2.5, 2.6, 2.5, 
and the foldable flare tube look through. Now that our cell is full of cold, mostly degassed, distilled water, we need to find the optimum resonance conditions. We are essentially redoing what we did with the tap water earlier, but this time the sinusoidal signal from the hydrophone should have a larger amplitude and be much steadier, since there should be no bubbles in the water in the cell. You need to scan the round to find the resonance. Be sure to check that you are on maximum resonance. In this rectangular cell, there is normally a lesser peak nearby that could confuse you. Once on resonance, adjust the horn depth in the water to get the maximum amplitude. Now close the box so we can look for sonoluminescence. Once the box is closed, we can turn the photomultiplier supply voltage up to about 8 or 9 again. We want to trigger on channel 2 of the oscilloscope, since that is the signal from the photomultiplier tube, or PMT as we often call it for short. Make sure you are seeing the usual random background pulses from the PMT, and that you can see the increased singles rate when the LED button is pressed. You'll also want to adjust the horn signal amplitude. Too small an ultrasound amplitude and the bubbles won't compress enough to sonoluminesce. Too large an ultrasound amplitude and the bubble will pre-dissolve before sonoluminescing. About 2.5 to 3 volts peak to peak from the hydrophone observed on channel 1 should work, but you will need to play with this a bit since it depends on various factors such as the water temperature and the amount of degassing. If everything looks good, we are ready to try seeing sonoluminescence. Very briefly press the heater coil power supply button to make a few bubbles. Make sure the variac controlling the heater voltage is not too high and don't press for more than an instant, otherwise you'll make too many or too large bubbles and overheat the water. About 25 or 30 volts seems to work, but you may need to play with this a bit. When you press the heater button, you should hear a gentle. There it is. We are seeing sonoluminescence. Those regular spikes on channel 2 are the sonoluminescence flashes. Play with the hydrophone amplitude and frequency a bit to optimize the size of the flashes. Of course, even though using the PMT or a camera is the way to make quantitative studies of sonoluminescence, you are going to want to see the glowing bubble yourself and show it to all your friends. So to do that, first turn off the photomultiplier tube voltage. Remember, always turn off the PMT voltage before opening the box. Once the box is open, we can drape some blackout cloth over the side to keep out most of the room light, holding it in a place with bulldog clips. If you are alone in the room, you can also turn out the overhead lights, but the blackout cloth is usually sufficient. Get underneath the cloth, keeping the heater button in hand. If you have just the right settings, the original bubble may still be sonoluminescing, but if you don't see anything, give your eyes a few seconds to adjust, and then press the button, heater button again. In this case, the sonoluminescence bubble is still there and still glowing. It is more impressive in person than on video, especially after your eyes dark adapt. A good bubble is bright enough to be seen, even with some room light entering the box. You are now ready to start studying sonoluminescence. It only took me about 40 minutes from start to finish, but I've had some practice. It will probably take you longer the first time. But if you aren't seeing sonoluminescence by your second lab period, be sure to talk to the supervising professor. Have fun.